Victorious Any% percent run of Ape Escape. Give it up. Good luck. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Hornlitz, and I'll let my couch introduce me. Or uh, everyone, <laughs> not me. <laughs> I introduce yes, me. This is Hornlitz. Um, I'm Orsa. I'm Silver. All right. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, let's just uh, get back to the title screen and... How do we get back here? Return. There we go. <laughs> I never enter the monkey book. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, I got to save and get out of here. Yeah. All right. And, uh, yeah, so uh, timing will actually... All right, timing will start when I uh, land on the ground right after I uh, skip the cutscenes, so I'll give a countdown when that happens. So, yeah, right off the bat, we just have a few cutscenes that I'm going to be skipping here. If somebody wants to explain the plot of the game, that'd be great. <laughs> uh, there's monkeys that are uh, trying to rewrite history. Uh, they somehow got access to this helmet, which makes them super intelligent. Uh, uh, hold on, hold on one second. Go for it. And go! go. Yeah, so these monkeys have mass-produced this mass intelligence helmet and are traveling back in time to try to rewrite history so that apes are the dominant species. And you're playing as Spike, who just happened to get to the time machine in time. So now he's been sent back to prehistoric times to catch all these monkeys and send them back to the present. Yep. Yep. So right off the bat, we already have a bit of uh, tech that I've been doing that you might not notice. So uh, the main one is called gadget cancelling. Uh, basically, whenever I use a gadget, uh, I'm going to be... Uh, normally Spike has like this animation where he pulls it back towards himself. Uh, but if you uh, switch to another gadget while that's happening, then uh, it, it just cancels that and you can move right away again. Yeah, it doesn't, like, each gadget cancel doesn't save too much time on its own. Like, maybe half a second at absolute most. Yeah, something like but that. But you have to keep in mind that Horn's going to be catching over 100 monkeys in this run. 102, so, to be precise. Yeah, it really starts to add up if you're not canceling every single net swing. So here we're in training. Um, every time you pick up a new gadget, you have to go through a little mini tutorial with it. Uh, here we've got the water net, which is going to let Horn catch monkeys in the water. Uh, pretty quick, not too complicated tutorial here before we get into the next level. All right. And could you also explain uh, neutral double jumping? Yeah. So in this game, uh, you do have access to a double jump. Uh, but the kind of annoying thing about it is if you continue to hold forward while you're double jumping, it will reset your momentum. So what Horn's going to be doing instead is every time you see him double jump, he's going to be letting go of the stick resetting it to neutral uh, before double jumping, which will let him maintain the momentum from the first jump. Also, check this out. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I got a fun little ground pound catch there. Whenever you ground pound with the net, the, uh, the hitbox for the net actually extends forward and up a bunch. So it's actually like a pretty big hitbox. So yeah, it's really, uh, really nice that we can catch that monkey like that. There is another way to do it with a slope jump, which we'll see another slope jump later. But uh, that way is just a little faster, and it looks cooler. Yes. All right. Every single time I enter a level, I'm actually going to be using an audio cue uh, to try and time a, uh, a button press so that I can enter the level right away. And it's a little bit risky because if I press at the wrong time, I can actually uh, re-enter the previous level, which just wastes like 20 seconds and it's annoying. But if I use the audio cue, that shouldn't happen. Nice, that looks good. Yeah. Yeah, Horn's trying to catch a cycle here. You can see this platform in the background here that's rotating. This one. Um, if that waterfall monkey misbehaves, then you can definitely miss that cycle, which costs, I don't know, too much time. Yeah, it's like <laughs> 10 seconds. All right, we got the last monkey right here. And with that, we are done the first world. Yep. Yes. Each world in this game... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Each world in this game has three levels, except for the very last one, which is just one level. Uh, and so, yeah, they, they kind of, like, progress through time. So this first one is, like, prehistoric era. Uh, the next one's, like, a little bit further forward in time, something like that. Mm -hmm. And now we have the, like, worst level in the entire game. Yep. <laughs> 
So right off the bat, we start with another training. This is the monkey radar. Uh, normally, you're supposed to use this to find the monkeys. Uh, I know where all 204 monkeys are in this game, so I don't need this. <laughs> but we still need to do the training for it. And I got the worst luck, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, so there are uh, six boxes here, and there are three monkeys spread throughout them. Um, it's not completely random. Like, it's not just six choose three. There's, I think, eight configurations. Uh, yeah, eight or nine, something like that. Um, and some of them are fast, some of them are slow. Just depends. Yeah. The, the worst luck loses six seconds over the fast, fastest, so it's not like it's a big deal. But. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And one other thing that I actually want to bring up is that right up off the bat here, you'll actually see me move the camera uh, to the right here. Uh, I'm going to be moving the camera a ton throughout this run because this game is actually a very laggy game. And so it's just, it's really beneficial to reduce lag whenever possible. And this next monkey is a really annoying monkey. <laughs> yeah, he's, so, he's the best. Yeah, basically it's random whether or not I catch him. So let's hope, hope I do. Nope. Ah, no worries. <laughs> yeah, you're intended to come back here once you have the slingshot to be able to shoot this guy down. But if your movement is really precise and you have a little bit of luck on your side, then you can actually catch him before he spots you, which saves about seven seconds. Yeah, fortunately, the backup monkey isn't too far. Yeah, no, it's just in another few seconds. So it's, yeah, it's not too bad. Yeah, but between the monkey radar luck and the UFO list monkey luck, this level's pretty annoying. Yeah, it's it. There's a huge like range of times that we get. So normally, if you got the UFO monkey, this would be the last monkey. Oops, <laughs> this would be the last monkey you get. But uh, yeah, we're just gonna go uh, into the next room right here and just catch a monkey that's right in front of us. Right there, we've done that. Yeah. One of the things that's really cool about this game as a speedrun is that none of the levels require you to catch all of the monkeys. It's always strictly less than the number of monkeys there are. So instead of just running from monkey to monkey to monkey, you can kind of route like which ones you think are the fastest. And there's a lot of different possibilities with these levels. Yeah, for sure. Speaking of different route possibilities, this <laughs> next level has a fun task only route. Yeah. Even in RTA, there's some some route variants in this level. Yeah, that's true. There is a uh, a, a lot more of a random monkey. I'm not going to be going for it. It's a bit risky, and it only saves two seconds. Actually, it's very risky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'll be going for a safer monkey. But yeah, it's and this monkey actually can also troll me a little bit. If he notices you a little bit too early, he can, uh, he can run really fast, uh, which actually leads me into another thing. Um, you can tell what a monkey is going to do based on the color of the pants that they're wearing. So that monkey was wearing dark blue pants, and uh, those monkeys are basically like Sonic the Hedgehog. They run ridiculously fast, and you're not going to be able to catch them unless you have a gadget that you get later on in the game. So, yeah, we really don't want that guy to get away. Yeah, I think that dark blue monkey is the first example of a non-yellow monkey in a speedrun, right? Uh, yeah, non-yellow or light blue. Yeah. The yeah. yellow and light blue monkeys are kind of just generic. They just walk around slowly. Mm -hmm. So right here, this is going to be the backup monkey that I'm getting instead of the risky monkey. There's just this one. Oops. <laughs> There's this one monkey over here. And now the movement getting back is really difficult. Oh, I failed. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. No, it's an intentional death warp. It just puts me right back up here. <laughs> that was uh, that was risky. <laughs> and then we're just gonna head into the basement here. Yeah, so this game actually does have fall damage. Um, Horn would have taken fall damage there, but by holding out a gadget as you fall and hit the ground, it cancels all possible fall damage. So the uh, the risky monkey that I would get is actually uh, just over there. Uh, <laughs> didn't really show it very well, but <laughs> yeah, the reason we don't get him is because there's uh, there's like a fan that he can turn on that blows you away, and it's really annoying to deal with that. <laughs> All right, so that's the first five levels done. Now we're gonna get into the real meat of the run. This is where the run really starts to pick up. Uh, we're going to be picking up a gadget in this next level, and it's a really good gadget. I love this gadget.
right, so this is going to be the slingback shooter, and it functions just like every good slingshot should. Yep. <laughs> Normal slingshots do that, right? Mm hmm Yeah. I don't think I've ever used one, so... <laughs> Yeah, so with that, we can just do an infinite jump glitch, and I'm going to be using this pretty much everywhere throughout the rest of the run. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see me equip it right away here, and I'll be using it every level after this. Yeah, so what's happening here is essentially that by pulling the slingshot back, the game grounds you for a, a small period of time, um, which lets you jump again, and then you can kind of just chain those inputs together. Um, it's a little precise, but it's not as nearly as yeah, hard it, as it, it looks. It takes a bit to get used yeah. to, but it's not too hard. So if you're playing along at home, feel free to try it. Now right here we've got the ill catch. Nice. <laughs> really good. You can catch that monkey through the wall. Right, now right here, I'm actually going to go for uh, this enemy uh, consistently drops at least one explosive, and so I want to grab that for uh, for use later on in the run. Uh, yeah. yeah, the slingback shooter or the slingshot has uh, three different types of pellets. It's got the normal pellet, which you can see I have equipped right now. There are an infinite, an infinite number of them. Then there are the explosive pellets, which just do more damage and actually like knock monkeys down. And then there are guided pellets, which you can like lock onto up to three different targets, and then the uh, th these different pellets will like shoot out and usually will hit them, but sometimes <laughs> they don't. The, the the targeting is a little like, especially on moving enemies, sometimes it just misses. They try their best, okay? Yeah, they do. <laughs> All right, now right here we have a really hard race with Jake. Um, it's, yeah, it's pretty tight. Um, that was hard. <laughs> yeah, good work. <laughs> so yeah, um, we don't actually have to do the Jake races. Uh, Jake's our friend, by the way. He, uh, he got brainwashed, uh, so he like hates us now or something. Uh, but yeah, we just we don't need to do the races. They just give us five Spectre coins for each race that we do, and those are just uh, extra collectibles for 100% that we don't need to get. Uh, and right here, uh, despite not having the uh, the slingshot, we have a fun out of bounds we can do. <laughs> the uh, the mailbox is put in a very convenient spot there, so we can just uh, get out of bounds there. Nice. That was clean. Yeah, yeah it was pretty clean. <laughs> Yeah, the Super Hoop is the sort of the second gadget in the, you know, Ape Escape speedrunning key, more or less. Uh, this is essentially just the gas pedal. Uh, when you swing it, it lets you run fast. Um, and what's really nice about this is that this momentum from the Super Hoop can be chained directly into an infinite jump, which you're going to be seeing in the next room, which essentially means that we've got all of our movement tools at this point. Yeah, the four tools he has equipped right now basically make up the meat of the speed run. Yeah, I'm going to be changing my gadget setup like a little bit later on in the run, but this is pretty much what you're going to be seeing for the most part. Not going to be ch changing much from this. There's your chain. Yeah, so the only key with this is that uh, just like with the neutral double jump, if you try to jump directly out of the boost tube, you won't carry the momentum through. So what you have to do is you have to perform what's called a boost jump by pressing the jump button and the hoop button to cancel it at the same time, which will carry your momentum through. Yeah. And if we go into some of the explanations for this game, as it is as a game, not necessarily a speed run, you've probably noticed that the four face buttons are always in the top right corner because in this game, how you jump is R1. Yeah, it's pretty awkward. <laughs> very unorthodox as far as we know. And the reason for that is because the devs for this game really wanted to make the first game that required analog control. Dual analog control. Yeah, dual analog control, yeah. my bad. So they just took this mechanic and turned it up to 11. <laughs> just cranked it up as far as it could go. It's a little weird to get used to at first, but it actually really works for the game. Yeah. Also, right here, I'm going to be going for an interesting little strat. I'm actually going to be infinite jumping up to here, and then I can do a little uh, hoop across the top here. It saves half a second <laughs> mm -hmm. over swimming. Hi -ya. Hi -ya. 
And then this monkey is actually a little bit slower. There is a faster monkey to get, but it is a pretty uh, risky monkey. He can like throw a million bombs at you, shoot you a few times, and there's an enemy right nearby. So it's just it's pretty risky to go for that monkey. So I just don't do it anymore. And it only saves like two or three seconds. So it's just much more consistent. Yeah, the monkeys in this game don't just defend themselves by flailing their arms and throwing bananas. They also have access to rockets and bombs like all monkeys do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Some even have guns. Yeah. Who gives monkeys guns? Uh, Spectre did. Okay. All right. So you all ready to enter Jabu Jabu's belly? <laughs> oh, wait, wrong game. Uh, <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> yeah, so this is Dexter. Uh, this is actually, I really like this level. Yeah, it's a good level. So there actually there were a few monkeys in the, the first room, but we actually want to skip those because we can't avoid going pretty far into the level. And once we hit like the later parts of the level, there's actually a bunch of monkeys really close by. So it just saves time to skip the first few monkeys. Plus the first room's really laggy, so. And right here, I'm actually going to be going for a pretty risky trick. Uh, well, sort of risky. Uh, it's a nice little out of bounds here. Nice. nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so had I failed that, I actually would have fallen down into uh, a bottomless pit. And the thing about bottomless pits in this game is that uh, at least the out of bounds ones, they don't have void planes underneath them. So if you run into them, you just fall infinitely. So you actually have to exit the level and it wastes way more time than it has any right to. <laughs> yeah, the terrain out of bounds is like existent but awkward. Um, Large sections of it are just missing, and you have the potential to just fall into a void and have to reset. Yeah, there's weird platforms everywhere, but you just have to know where they are at this point. This would be a good time to bring up that every single monkey has a little bit of RNG to it, or a lot of RNG, <laughs> and or randomness, and yeah, it's, uh, you kind of have to do a lot of, like, on the fly, like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like routing? Not not exactly improv? routing, but yeah, like just improv, like yeah. movement and stuff, just to make sure you can catch a monkey if you happen to miss it the first time or something. Yeah. All right, and now we've got Snowy Mammoth. We are in the Ice Age era. Uh, right at the start of this level, I have a pretty tricky jump that I'm going to be going for. So hopefully, I get this. It saves two seconds. Yeah, this level is based entirely around, as you might guess from the title, a giant mammoth who's uh, who's walking around in a circle at some point. Um, so you want to catch a good cycle on this mammoth in order to catch the monkey on his back. Yeah, unfortunately, I missed the uh, the little stick there. We call it stick jump. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's a little risky. So this guy's in a bit of a, that miss. That's not. Oh, that one missed too, actually. <laughs> Okay. I think that, uh -huh. I don't know, that was a little weird. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, and uh, he didn't fall off that, uh, I'll just shoot him with a normal pellet. Another. Oh, I need to shoot him with another. There we go. There you go. Okay, yeah, I was talking earlier about how guided pellets sometimes miss. Well, uh, there yeah. you saw it. <laughs> no worries, though. And you don't want to hit that monkey with just normal pellets because it takes numerous hits and after you hit him once, he becomes aggravated and starts shooting you from anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> he's no. a pretty good shot too. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's really good. Doesn't really give you time to stop and aim after that. Right at the start of this next level, we are going to be getting another new gadget. Uh, this gadget is called the Sky, the, the Sky Flyer. It's the intended way to get vertical height, but of course, because we have the infinite jump glitch, uh, yeah, I'm not really going to be using this very much. I'll use it once in the run. <laughs> yeah, it's still useful in a couple spots, but the problem is you have to pause the game to switch to it, which tends to not be worth it except in a few spots. Yeah, it's always a good backup strategy, but uh, yeah, hopefully I won't need to do the, a backup strategy. Let's go! All right, but at this point, it's just a bunch of uh, catching a few more monkeys, so uh, if you want to read off a few donations, you're, you can. Cheer thing, Horn, you're getting a lot of love from your community. Oh, yeah? Uh, here's somebody you might know. I don't know, he has no name. Oh! I have no name since it's $10. 
He says, hey, Hornlet's hecklers hoping horrible happenings hardly happen here. Nailed it. It's been amazing since uh, seeing this game evolve over the past nine years, and even more amazing that new things keep getting discovered after all this time. Can't wait to see what we'll come up with next. Jesse says, beep boop. <laughs> Matthew says, hi. Spectre says, 28 cycles are bust. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. A uh, shout out to No Name. He's uh, pretty much the pioneer of this speed run. Uh, he was like the first one to do runs of it like nine years ago. He's the one who introduced me to this game. And he's a really good friend of mine. So thank you very much for the donation. You up for another one? Yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you to Murphy for a $10 donation. Ooh. They say, hey, Orlitz, Murphy here. Had to make sure I caught your run before I headed to work. And the Gametal server is watching you too, so here's to a good monkey bashing run. Yeah, thank you, Murby. And shout out to the whole Gametal community. If you've heard, um, actually, between runs, there have been a bunch of uh, uh, remixes that have been playing, uh, and a, a few of them have been from uh, Gametal, who's a good friend of mine. So, yeah, just shout out to the whole Gametal community. They're wonderful people. All right, now here we have Hot Springs. This is the first, like, vertical based level. And, uh, of course, because we have the uh, IJ device, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's not too much of a challenge, but actually doing this without infinite jumping is, like, it's actually kind of difficult. <laughs> yeah, there actually is a no infinite jump category in the leaderboards, which is really interesting, especially levels like this. Ooh, that was bad. <laughs> there we go. Nailed it. <laughs> nice. First try. Yeah, there's some people who argue that the no IJ category is better than the infinite jump category. I, I personally don't agree, but... <laughs> yeah, even if you throw out the infinite jump, there's still a lot of cool, like, sort of glitchy movement tech to this game. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. There's a lot of really cool movement with the no IJ category. Yeah, so it's still super interesting. Yes! All right, with that, we are out of the Ice Age. Good, it was getting too cold. <laughs> oh, here we have another Jake race. This one is a little harder than the last one. Let's hope I can do this well. Nice. Nice, I got the pause before it even said start. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so now we are in the medieval era. This, uh, this is a pretty good, good world. I like the levels in this one. Yeah. Right off the bat, we're actually going to see one of the coolest catches in the entire run. Uh, we have three monkeys right in the center up ahead here, and hopefully I can catch all three right in one go. Beautiful. Yes. Oops, that did not shoot. Yeah, that's definitely one of my favorite catches in the game. Um, if you're, again, if you're playing along at home, that's actually pretty doable. You don't even have to do the boost jump necessarily. You can just hoop right into the middle of the three and catch them all. Impress your friends. It looks really slick too. It does. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> Oops. There we go. All right. Easy. Yes. If you got some more donations, you can read some right now. Certainly. Flurgandy sends us $222. Hey. Whoa, hey. It says, good luck, Hornlets, on your Ape Escape run. Unfortunately, I can't watch the run live because I'm having a monkey around at work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you like puns, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Flurgandy. That was very generous of you. Flurgandy is another good friend of mine. All right, now here we have Wabi Sabi Wall. This level is actually pretty intimidating for new runners because we have a lot of infinite jump chains over like large pits of void. And so it's very easy to void out. So like not dropping your IJs is very important. And this next room is really luck-based. <laughs> Another one of uh, the worst rooms in the game, kind of. Ooh, what's this guy doing? Oop, ah. swung the wrong way. 
Oh, he, uh, he yeah. doesn't usually jump up. Ooh, this is weird. <laughs> Where's it going? Nope, get back <laughs> over here. <laughs> there we go. Nice. <laughs> yeah, gong room. We call this gong room because there's a gong in the middle there. Yeah, it's one of the trickier parts. It's possible to catch all three monkeys right at the center there in the gong, but it's pretty rare. I've only had it a few times. This guy can sometimes shoot you and then you fall into a void. It's really annoying, but fortunately that didn't happen. And now this monkey right here, we actually aren't supposed to be able to get it right now. We normally need a gadget from uh, later on in the game, but uh, yeah, we can just shoot a pellet straight through the wall and can get that monkey early, which is really nice because uh, this level, we actually have to catch all but two of the monkeys in the level. And the last two monkeys are in the last room and they're like pretty far into the last room. And not only that, but they're really annoying monkeys. Mm -hmm. So it's really nice that we don't have to go that far. Right, and next up we have Crumbling Castle. This is a pretty unique level in that this is a boss level. So every other level, uh, the requirement for beating the level has been to catch a certain number of monkeys. In this one, we actually just have to beat a boss. So you won't be seeing me catch a single monkey in this level. Yeah, you're intended to be catching some monkeys here in order to just like open up doors and move obstacles out of the way and such. But because of the infinite jump, uh, we can get out of bounds right here and skip catching every single monkey in the level. Actually, you don't even need to infinite jump for that. You can oh, oh. yep, you can do it with a sky flyer, and uh, it's it's actually not too difficult. Yeah, it's yeah, surprisingly it's... easy to get out of bounds here. And we can just enter this loading zone out of bounds. And doing this level intentionally is actually very lengthy. Yeah, it's a pretty long level. So this this skip is actually very convenient. In the all monkeys category, which, as you would guess, catches all of the monkeys in the game, uh, this is one of the longer levels. Yeah, I think it tacks on like another three minutes on top of what Horn's doing here. Yeah, at least. All right, and at this point, we just got to go and head up to the boss. Uh, the whole goal of the level was to hit that button that was in the room that I was just in, because uh, that opens up the, the boss door. And unfortunately, as far as we are aware, there is no way to skip the boss door. We have tried going out of bounds by the boss door. The loading zone just doesn't seem to be there. <laughs> so yeah, it's a little unfortunate that we can't skip that. It would be a nice big time save if we could, but ah, whatever. <laughs> uh, and I also want to make sure that I'm at full health before going into this boss, because we actually have a damage abuse strat for this boss. So uh, normally this boss, uh, the way you're supposed to beat it is uh, he gets electrified and then you can, you have to wait for him to like run around and wait for him to stop uh, being electrified and then you can attack him. But if you just get hit immediately, it ends the invulnerability phase right away. And so you can just damage him and it saves a lot of time. Yeah, if you do this very specific set of inputs, two explosives and then two stun club hits, uh, he goes down in four hits and you obviously have five. So... Very easy boss here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was like really close, like way yeah. closer than I wanted it. <laughs> it looked cool though. It looked cool. Yeah, if you void out, you have to redo the boss, so I'm really glad I didn't die. <laughs> And with that, we are actually done with the levels that are in the past. Now we're back in, I think, the present, maybe the future. Yeah. Uh, and monkeys have taken over. More so than usual, you know. <laughs> so first we enter City Park, and uh, we actually get a gadget. Uh, we get the RC car. Uh, this is, you're supposed to use this to, like, lure monkeys out of areas and uh, kind of, like, yeah, just manipulate, excuse me, manipulate them. But uh, yeah, we aren't going to be using this very much. <laughs> yeah, if anything, we mostly use it as a weapon. Yeah, uh, when the RC car explodes, it actually does like the same amount of damage as an explosive pellet from the slingshot. So you'll see me use that in a few places. All right, now this level, um. The very first monkey is, you're actually supposed to use the RC car for it, but we actually don't need to do that. Uh, we can come up to the side here 
and just wait for the monkey to walk forward, and then we can, oop, if he stops doing some animations yeah, there, there. You go. yeah, we can just catch him right through the wall. Yeah, he will always walk forward. It's just a matter of how long he decides to take to do so. Yeah, sometimes we've seen up to like six animations that he does. It's silly, but yeah, that's pretty rare. All right, and of course, with the infinite jump glitch being able to get pretty high, we're actually going to be uh, coming through uh, this level backwards. Uh, so this right here, you're actually supposed to uh, come out this way once you've gone through the sewers, but of course, we can just get up here and go through it backwards, and it saves a bunch of time. Yeah, this is a pretty dangerous level here. There's oh, sure. lots of aggressive monkeys, lots of enemies all over the place. Like this guy. This guy's yeah. pretty aggressive. This guy's not usually too bad, yeah. <laughs> Uh, these enemies right here, uh, we call them purple Pikachus. Uh, I don't actually know why, but right. <laughs> I guess they They're just kind of look, like look like Pikachu. I yeah. guess. <laughs> Oops. Uh, but yeah, this uh, this little area right here in this pipe, we have a monkey to catch and a purple Pikachu to deal with, and it's really annoying. Like as you can see here, <laughs> how did that miss? No, it didn't. Uh, uh. <laughs> Okay, that was a little silly, but... Yeah, the sloped uh, sides of the pipe are particularly annoying because if you are... Uh, if your damage animation gets cancelled by the slope, so you start sliding, you can just get infinite comboed by the purple Pikachu, and yeah, it's super dangerous there. Yeah. If you got some more donations, you can read them. Hey, appreciate it, Horn. $50 comes from Rose the Red Panda. They say, had to donate during the first game I ever 100% completed. And we have a lore-related question from Stab with his $10 donation. He says, I've been a big fan of Hornlet since his last Ape Escape run at a GDQ. Blew my mind. Glad to see him back, and I had to get up early to watch this run. One question, though. Why is the player's health represented by crackers? Oh, uh, they're actually cookies. Um, what? Yeah, they're cookies. They're I, cookies. Uh, I have no idea why. <laughs> I don't think it explains it. Mind blown twice, Stab. <laughs> All right, uh, Master Frasca sends us $250. Ooh, that's a big one. Thank you. He says, hey, SGDQ, donating during one of my favorite games of all time, Ape Escape. Love what you guys are doing and love watching all these amazing speedruns. Keep up the good work and catch those monkeys. Thank you. So right here, this is actually uh, the biggest route change that uh, I have from the last run that I did here. Uh, I am actually going to skip a monkey, and I'm going to go for a mech fight here, uh, because uh, using some explosive pellets, we can make it go real fast. So hopefully I can get this. And hopefully I don't crash. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, it's oh, too early. That's yeah. fine. <laughs> so long as you hit it with two explosives, uh, you only you only have to do four hits on it. So it's it ends up saving time still. Uh, oops, missed that. There we go. And I'm glad I didn't crash because yeah, <laughs> I have crashed on that mech uh, three times in the last week or so. So it's I was a little nervous about that, but yeah, glad that didn't happen. Yeah, that was added in like fairly recently. Yeah, that's uh, pretty recent. That fight can be super fast if you get all the quick hits. Like you saw how fast the first two hits were there. Um, and if you just keep comboing the mech like that, it goes down like very, very quickly. Yeah, unfortunately I only had three explosives so I couldn't uh, like just kill him with explosives, but uh, yeah, it was still pretty fast. I'm sorry, B-Man, I don't do your strats. <laughs> you can catch that guy without the RC car. Uh, you can just shoot him with a, a, a slingshot pellet through the wall, and then he can run out. But uh, I have trouble with doing that. Sometimes he just doesn't run out. So I just use the RC car to make it more consistent, especially since I need the RC car out for the next level anyways. All right. You can read some more donations. Sounds fantastic. Uh, Grogfella138 since $20. This so is not playing with the European dub. Blasphemous! Just kidding. Have fun with Buzz. I mean Jake. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Cat's Meow Creative gets right to the quick with her $10 donation. She says, I am a simple woman. I see monkeys and I donate. Good luck in the Ape Escape run. Thank you. All right, so this is TV Tower. This is another boss-related level, so we don't theoretically need to catch monkeys in this level, but uh, we do because we need to open some doors. Oops, I want that explosive there. All right. 
Yeah, this level is a little bit better uh, locked up than Crumbling Castle is, so it's hard to out of bounds and skip anything in this level. Well, Crumbling Castle is also built as one large maze. Was, yeah. This is more linear. Oh, this is awkward. Okay, I, I messed up some movement, so I'm kind of having to do some weird things. You can shoot a button through a wall there. Uh, you can also hit it with a stun club, which is what I normally do, but I don't have the stun club equipped right now. And right here, hopefully I can get this, we have a really fun catch. It's actually one of my favorite catches in the game. Uh, I'm going for it again. I'm, I'm getting this. <laughs> Uh, that's not great. Mm. Come on, one more time. Yeah, so what we're going for here is whenever you hit a monkey that's uh, climbing on the handlebars, they get uh, sort of knocked up a little bit before they start falling down. And if you use the explosion from the RC car, they get knocked up a lot, which actually puts him up through the bars just enough for you to be able to catch him if you switch to the net at the right time. Yeah, it's a little unfortunate I failed that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little shame I didn't get to show that off there. That's it's, okay. It is a bit of a precise trick. Using the uh, the RC car, you can make it a little more consistent. Uh, the old strategy was to use the stun club to uh, to hit the the uh, the monkey, but that makes it so that you only have one frame to switch to the the net to catch the monkey, and it's really precise. And I'm just bad at it. Yeah. It is technically faster to do it that way, but. Yeah, Horn's also been picking up a lot of explosive pellets here. We definitely want to have nine going into this stage's boss. Yeah, and I just got the ninth, so I'm all stocked up. Yeah, fortunately, these enemies that are flying around will are guaranteed to drop three explosive pellets, so easy to stock up. All right, catch that guy before he goes into the mech thing there. And then that guy, and that's the last monkey we need to catch in this level. So that opens up the boss door, and now we can go to the boss. And this boss is really dumb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really dumb and fairly complicated, so we'll do our best to explain it. The biggest problem is that it's very luck-based. This is like one... <sighs> uh, oops, that was... I did that wrong. Uh, there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ooh. So yeah, we got this gigantic uh, helicarrier thing. I don't know what to call it, but <laughs> uh, yeah, it's going to fly around, shoot some missiles at me. We want to dodge those. Um, and then uh, he's going to fly down over to the helipad there. And then uh, he has one of two attacks that he can do. Uh, or yeah, he's two different attacks. Uh, there's a red attack and a blue attack. We want the red one. Of course, the, the I get the one. blue one. <laughs> <laughs> the blue one uh, shoots out a bunch of uh, UFOs. The first one targets you, so we just kill that, and then we leave the other three. Uh, and it loses seven seconds over getting the red one. This is the red attack, where it's just a big like line of fire. And yeah, it's, it's pretty quick. Yeah, so this boss is then going to repeat what he just did once. So he's going to fly around, shoot the missiles, land, and then do two attacks. Um, which means you have four coin flips here that you would like them all to be red. Um, so there's a lot of potential for time loss on this boss just due to randomness. Hey! hey. <laughs> <laughs> so right there I just triggered what we call sound glitch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Basically, for some reason, when you start the hoop and uh, some other gadgets, like a lot in one level, uh, it will like start repeating the sound over and over again, and it gets really annoying. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, in this level at least, it uh, you can cancel the glitch as well. But in other levels, like the only way to cancel it is to exit the level. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Please. Okay, we're good. <laughs> so. If you remember, we mentioned that uh, normally this guy like only goes and uh, does those like the blue or red attack twice, uh, like two sections of it. Well, he can actually do it three, four, maybe five times if he really wants, but uh, it's pretty unlucky to have that happen. And it loses like 20 seconds if he uh, if he goes back to the first phase again, so it's it's really annoying. Actually, it's probably more than 20. It, I mean, it yeah. depends on what luck you get, I yeah. guess. 
All right, so that's the third hit. Uh, this boss has one more hit to it. Um, Horn is going to be trying to hit him with the stun club. Yes? Uh, and with another explosive. With another explosive, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you want to let him come in a little bit on the last hit because he has to come toward the center to explode no matter what. Um, so there's a couple strats. You can try the stun club, you can use the sky flyer, or you can just use another explosive to take him out. Yes! All right, and with that, that is the second last level of the game, and we're going into the last one, which takes up approximately like a quarter of the run. Yeah, the last <laughs> it's a really long easy. level. Yeah. That's not quite a quarter, it's a little less than that, but yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty long level. It's got two sections to it, so. You can see how big it is on the map. Like, it takes up the whole screen. Yeah, it takes up the whole screen. It's pretty big. So this first section is like an amusement park of sorts. Uh, so we're going to go to the uh, the circus first. Yeah. Basically, right off the bat, we're going to be uh, going and rescuing our three friends. We have the professor, we have Natalie, and we have Jake. Uh, so we want to rescue all three of them. So the first one is the professor here. Uh, so we're just going to infinite jump up this section. This section's really annoying with uh, <laughs> without IJing up there. Mm -hmm. And now for this guy, I'm actually going to wait until he starts moving towards me uh, so that uh, he keeps moving towards me after I hit him. Because if I shot him right away, uh, he would go th to a, like a completely different attack phase where he like becomes invulnerable for a while and he shoots out a bunch of balloons that are explosive and it's really annoying. Oh, I missed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I am... Okay. <laughs> So I hit the guy with the, uh, the RC car explosion because, as I mentioned earlier, it does more damage, and so it only takes two hits to, uh, to finish the clown off instead of three. All right, and now here's the one time I'm going to be using the Sky Flyer. <laughs> Oop, that was... Not right there. There's, I need it after the coaster here, but yeah. I just equip it now because it saves a little bit of time to use it there. But now we have a nice uh, two-minute auto-scroller, and shout outs to Skateman222, another wonderful runner of this game. Uh, he started the tr tradition of doing this with your chin, so I'm going to follow suit. <laughs> and uh, you could, this would be a great time for some donations. Fantastic. Corn, while you do those chin strats. I am Ranger Bob, since it's $50. It says, hey, bro, the cat misses you. My only problem with the speed run is that you have to skip all the Spectre cutscenes. Good luck on the rest of the run. Uh, that's my sister. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, Spectre is the best, absolutely. <laughs> I've been holding on to this one. El Rotado since it's $20. This is a long time watcher, first time donator. So you know I'm not monkeying around when I say I'm hyped for this Ape Escape run. Thank you very much. These monkey puns are so bananas, huh? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you can keep going for some more. Sounds good. Set back with a $25 donation. It says, how good are the GDQ or tongue twisters? Here's an ape-based one. Enjoy. Ooh. If eight great apes ate 88 grapes, guess how many grapes each great ape ate? Wow, you did a really good job of oh, that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I listened to a lot of East Coast hip hop. That was uh, that was pretty good stuff. <laughs> thank you very much for that donation. All right, so now that we're done the coaster, uh, here we have to rescue Natalie. Uh, and right here, we're actually going to be skipping this entire haunted house section uh, with some clever IJs. This is where we need to use the Sky Flyer. Uh, we need to like change directions in midair to land over here. And this room is the worst. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right, yeah, I got one cycle. That's yeah. that's the best you can do. All right. <laughs> yeah, if you let any of those monkeys get away, they'll run into the coffins and waste all your time. So. Yeah, it's annoying. Fortunately, at least they always come out of the same coffin, so it's really easy to catch them if they do, but yeah, it's still annoying. 
Now right here, uh, I actually equ uh, equipped the super hoop before uh, exiting the level so that I could start the hoop immediately when entering this level because for some reason this cutscene that opens up the coaster here, or not the coaster, the uh, RC cars, or go cards, <laughs> go carts, uh, <laughs> It's, uh, it takes like two extra seconds to load for some reason. So yeah, it's just a little bit faster there. Now this fight is, uh, normally it's, like casually it takes really long. Uh, you're supposed to like attack him and then it takes like five hits to kill him mm -hmm. or to break the car. We don't kill our friend Jake. Uh, but you can actually pin it against the wall here and just uh, get all five hits immediately. <laughs> it's just really fast. All right, and then we're done with the first half. We just have to go on to the second. Uh, fun fact about the uh, the Jake fight: you can actually enter that before you've beat, uh, before you've rescued the other two uh, characters. But unfortunately, uh, this this door doesn't open until you rescue all three. Yeah, this level's locked up tight. But if anyone could find a skip, it would save a lot. A of lot, time. like five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Also, I'm really happy entering that uh, loading zone has a low chance of actually soft-locking or crashing the game. Uh, <laughs> I've had it happen once to me on a pretty good pace run. It was uh, really annoying, but yeah, fortunately that didn't happen. <laughs> All right, and now we are entering the second part of Monkey Madness. So this is like Spectre's castle in the sky or in the clouds of this. Stars space. or something, I don't know. Yeah, yeah in space. <laughs> Where all amusement parks go. <laughs> yes. Oh shoot, I fell off oh, the edge. No. I'm gonna die. That? Well, at least I triggered the cutscene. Yeah. Yeah, you have to alert this monkey to uh, spawn the next set that you need to catch to open the door. Oh, actually, I'm way back up here. That just saved a bunch of time. Wow, how convenient. <laughs> yeah, that was obviously intentional. <laughs> And now we have the UFO monkeys. Unfortunately, these two UFO monkeys are required. We cannot skip them. So I'm going to use what guided pellets I have and what uh, aiming skills I have to try and take these guys down. They take three hits. So uh, <laughs> hopefully this goes well. all right. That first one all went right. pretty well. Yeah, that was nice. Oh, he didn't even see you. Yeah, I'm really nice. yeah you, he landed far away. I was yeah. pretty scared there. Uh, fortunately, if you don't go too close to these UFOs, they have really predictable patterns. They just kind of move in a circle. Uh, but if you go close to them like this, they start moving around. Nice. <laughs> I didn't jinx you this time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's possible to uh, desync the hitbox for those UFOs from the model of them, and that makes them like impossible to hit, mm -hmm. which actually happened in my last GDQ run of this. <laughs> so I had to reload the room. But fortunately, that didn't happen this time. So as intended, you're supposed to go through this long gauntlet of obstacles to open the painting to get to Spectre, but you can skip all that with the IJ. Yeah, the loading zone just bleeds through the wall a little bit there, so you can just skip the whole thing. <laughs> Saves a lot of time. And with this, we are in the final boss. So this first phase, we just have to hit this boss six times. Do I have any explosive pellets? I don't know. Yeah, you yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. Might as well use it. <laughs> oh, I missed. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's not letting up. Come on. Look at him go. What? Oh, actually, I'm about to die. Uh, this is this could be bad. One more hit. OK, we're good. <laughs> it was a little risky. All right, time for the best boss. Oh, How yeah. <laughs> How many cycles place your bets? Uh, no name earlier said 28, so... Uh, <laughs> yeah, this guy has a couple different attacks. There's one. He will only hit you whenever he does this. Like, this is the only time you can hit him. If he does anything else, you're just losing time. Yeah, uh, except for this time, uh, he can't do the same attack twice in a row while he has two arms, so that attack was guaranteed to not be a red laser. Yeah. yeah. I'm really scared about, about dying here. <laughs> Actually, I'm gonna... Let these guys shoot because they yeah. usually drop cookies. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Also, I'm uh, going into first person mode because that reduces a ton of lag. Okay, well, I've already lost count. <laughs> yeah. This is like six or seven, I think. Yeah, something like that. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> nope, there's blue lasers. <laughs> Okay, well, maybe 28 <laughs> cycles was right. <laughs> All right oh, there we got a second one. A little unfortunate he did it with the other arm, because now the next one's guaranteed to not be a 
a red laser. Oops, I missed there. <laughs> Probably have time for one donation. Fantastic. Huck sends us $25. They say, love what you guys do. I watch this each and every year and try to donate. Also, thanks to everyone for making this possible. This community makes me proud to be a gamer. Thank you. There we go. Okay, there's the last attack. So that was probably like 14 or 15 attacks. Yeah. That's a little worse than average, but still not the, that bad. The worst we've seen is 38 attacks. <laughs> so yeah, that can be really annoying, but yeah, fortunately it wasn't that bad. Nope. Uh, oh, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Got a little ahead of myself there. Yeah, so that's the first hit. Uh, timing's gonna end whenever he hits the boss for the third time. Yeah. Might as well use my explosive here. <laughs> There's two. All right, and just one more. So yeah, time is going to be real soon here. And this last time he's going to shoot uh, twice, so we just want to get uh, the two side ones. All right, get ready on time. Time. All right. Also, shout out to the voice acting. <laughs> you ruined everything. If it weren't for you, everything would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Put a stop to this now. I love it. That's <laughs> good. But anyways, that's uh, that's enough of that. <laughs> All right. Well, that's the run. That was Ape Escape. Uh, if you guys are looking for like a good uh, entry level speed run, this level is actually really easy to learn. Uh, it's hard to master, but it, uh, really the infinite jump glitch. Once you get the hang of that, which it's not too hard to do, uh, it's actually a really easy run to actually like just complete runs of. So it's a great starter run. Um, we have lots of wonderful people in the community willing to help out. Um, uh, but yeah, thank you, GDQ, for letting me run this. Uh, thank you to my commentators. No problem. did a great job. Uh, thank you to the host. You did a wonderful job. Uh, yeah, and yeah, that's, that's the end. So yeah, thanks again. Cool. Everybody give it up for Hornlets one more time. Oh, you're already ahead of me. First fantastic run of Ape Escape. Now, I saved this donation for the end of the run. Uh, Jessica sends us $5. She says, what do you call a flying monkey? A hot air baboon. Thank you so much for that generous donation and that horrifying pun. All right, well, I'll let you guys drink that in. Let me play a quick Twitch ad. We'll be right back. Ladies and, gentlemen, well, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, welcome on back to Summer Games Done Quick 2019. Man, we are so close. We are less than $1,000 for both 300K and the Crash Bandicoot 3 Future Tense Race following the upcoming Crash 3 run. Looking to the future, though, we have some pretty incredible stuff for Zallard's Punch-Out Games. We are so close to getting blindfolded uh, Zallard for going through Punch-Out! Wii, it's less than $5,000. You want to see him cement his status further as the legend of GDQ. Put your donations towards that. He doesn't need the highlight reel. He is the highlight reel. Let's be honest here.
Towards that end, we got some donations going towards the future tense incentive, hoping to push us over. Sam here says, uh, long time watcher, first time donator, crash and punch out are my lifeblood. Got to show my support during this block. Let's bash those borders and let's get that bread. Thank you for that $30 donation. Callum Comer sends us $100, says, so, man, so amazing to see so many fantastic runners this year. Much love from Australia. Let's get that Crash Bandicoot future tense incentive. And with that, I'm going to be tossing over to the interviewer, Aero Fiesel, is going to be interviewing Eric Omnigamer Koziel for his book, Speedrun Science, a short guide to long playthroughs. Hey everybody, I'm Fiesel, and I am here with Omnigaver, author of the new book, Speedrun Science, A Long Guide to Short Playthroughs. So Omni, what was your inspiration in writing this book? And I gotta say, this was a fantastic book, and I really enjoyed well, reading the, the third of it that I got to read just <laughs> yesterday sitting in the practice room. But what was your inspiration here for this? So, uh, I, it's been a couple things. I, like, since I was a kid, I had always wanted to write a book. I figured that when I was writing that book, it would probably be some high fantasy with dragons and magic and all the rest of that mm -hmm. stuff. But then I became an engineer, and uh, a lot of that kind of went out the window. So, um, But it uh, was something that, uh, when I was going through my own speedrunning experiences, um, I kind of developed my own process, something that would help me to be able to route the runs better, something to help me practice, basically become more efficient at the game better. And uh, that's something that well, it helped me to really enjoy speedrunning, first of all, but it's something that I also saw, uh, at least in those earlier years, like a lot of people were kind of, they were confused about how to actually go about it themselves. Mm -hmm. They didn't really know um, how to structure, say, practice, or figure out something that they were, were missing, some new knowledge that they needed. And um, that kind of spurred the, the inspiration to actually come up with, all right, I need to make... Uh, some crystallization of, of the process I've come up with and share it with people so that they can kind of help themselves uh, make better speed runs and overall just improve uh, the quality of, of runs going out. Sort of trying to answer the question, how do I speed run? And I, I hear people ask that a lot. How do I get started or what do I do to route a game or what do I do to practice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's something that, like, there's... It's not natural for a lot of people. Uh, you come into a, a game as kind of its own new world, and you have to figure out how the physics work from the, the ground up, how to uh, determine like where your problems are. How do you remove those? How do you optimize them away? How do you actually get your, your fingers able to uh, manipulate the buttons in the way that you need to for certain tricks, for just optimizing your own uh, efficiency and headroom? And uh, there's a lot of tricks to actually make that easier. And that's something that I wanted to, to help share. Yeah, and I think it's great that not only does this book cover uh, the basics of speedrunning, the whole process of speedrunning, from research to routing, to practice and execution, but it, in a broader sense, it covers the philosophy of speedrunning and the history of speedrunning as well. There's a lot of material in here for people who don't even speedrun but are just fans of it and kind of want to, mm -hmm. you know, le learn more about it. So, what made you sort of expand to, to sort of include more than just the, the process? That was kind of an evolution as I was starting to write out the book. Like I initially intended, this is just going to be the, the one stop. This is the guide to, to speed running and it'll help you be a better runner. Mm -hmm. But um, even just going through GDQs and interacting with all these people who are enthusiastic about speed running, they're not necessarily runners themselves, but they really want to know more about it, uh, what goes into it. Uh, and a lot of that, uh, there's plenty of content 
there for them too. Um, and I really just wanted to make this something that's accessible, something that would be valuable to uh, all of the uh, casual viewers of speedruns, uh, just as much as the, the grizzled veterans uh, looking for something to improve their game. So uh, I went through and actually tried to define kind of what is a speedrun in, in a technical sense? How do you uh, map that to, well, what is it as an activity? What is the, the feedback mechanism with you, a player in a game? Uh, but insofar as uh, also including uh, where it came from. So uh, a lot of people uh, are just now coming into what speedrunning is, thanks to Games on Quick and a lot of other online presence on Twitch and otherwise. But it goes back some 20, 30 years even uh, to a lot more build-up, something that actually helped it to get to where it is today. And I wa wanted to help explore that, and uh, that turned itself into its own section of the book. So some uh, 20, 30 percent of the book is talking about just where speedrunning came from. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. And this book, I should point out, is, is beautifully illustrated. There's all kinds of figures, diagrams, pictures, photographs. You have a section here where we're talking about the early GDQs, here graph with the, gra uh, with the, the growth of, of um, GDQ viewership and donations. Mm -hmm. and yeah, and it was a great thing to actually look through and kind of catalog some of that, uh, especially with uh, like individual sections talking about, well, Games Done Quick was a, a big uh, contributor during the early 2010s on into now and to today. But just as much, I have um, a whole bunch of illustrations and diagrams that help to explain more technical aspects. Um, you might see over there, there's discussions of kind of what's happening under the hood of a game. How do you actually interpret their uh, coordinate systems? How does hitboxes work? And that kind of thing. And that's a lot of kind of knowledge that you can pick up, but isn't necessarily intuitive. Definitely. And I, I think that it's really great the range of topics that you cover both in the technical side and the historic side and the social context of it all. Now, in the process of writing this book, you ended up talking with a lot of people who were influential in the development of speedrunning and, you know, the culture surrounding the, the early days of it in general. Like, who mm -hmm. were some of the people that you talked to? Oh, this is, you know, that was actually one of the most uh, interesting parts for me is going through this uh, process and identifying the significant individuals. So I talked to a lot of uh, early speedrunners, uh, like not a lot of people today would recognize the name Tom Vodava, but I'm, I'm I sure, sure would. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do. Uh, I also talked to, um, let's see, Walter Day, who was the founder of Twin Galaxies. Uh, there was an opportunity to talk to John Romero, who was uh, the, one of the creators of Doom. Uh, and that was really interesting because they had some uh, very significant points early on in the speedrunning history that helped to enable it to proliferate. Uh, and he had some really good insights. And that was, uh, on, it was really fun for me because he's also one of my, uh, well, I played a lot of Doom as a kid. And it, yeah, was, it was a lot of fun. as well. And it's just uh, kind of a celebrity uh, sort of moment for me to be able to ask those questions and, and talk to somebody who had uh, shaped some of my early gaming life. Yeah, there are some great quotes in this book from John Romero mm -hmm. in particular. Uh, now, another thing that you'll see all over this book are case studies. Um, you kind of went into detail on different subjects. Uh, what was your, your reasoning behind including that in the format? <laughs> uh, you know, some of the, the best comments that I've gotten, the feedback on the book so far is like, um, oh, somebody said, you know, this is, this is just like my high school textbook, mm -hmm. but I mean that in the best way. <laughs> and uh, the, the idea is that a lot of the concepts that I talk about, you might understand them, from reading the text, but you don't really internalize it until you've come across a situation where you need to apply it. Mm -hmm. And there's many, many situations across many different games that require that. Uh, what I was hoping to do is to help a reader to actually experience that themselves. So I have uh, an entire example of, of routing kind of a, a theoretical game. I have individual uh, spots where you need to calculate, let's say, uh, what the most efficient path, uh, given certain circumstances, uh, what you have to consider with uh, animation timers and that kind of thing. Like a lot of instances where it's just taking it a step beyond, here's something that you can do, and here, try it yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. And uh, we're almost out of time here. I just wanted to point out that you do a lot more than just write this book and speed run. Um, you have a lot of projects going on related to gaming. You want to briefly just mention a couple of those? Sure. I'll, I'll just talk to them real briefly. I mean, I've, I've done plenty of speed runs, um, and I'd love to continue doing speed runs. I, I've had like 15 GDQ appearances up to now. Um, I've done a lot of hitbox viewer and helper scripts um, for various games. Uh, I, there's the whole dragster analysis thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also do 
um, Mash Attack, which is That's these, these bo wonderful boxes, boxes right here. here. Uh, if you're actually at the event, I'll, I'll have these set up later, but it's essentially a, a button mashing analysis tool to help you improve your abilities and uh, make it a little bit plug in nest and easier. controllers there, too. Oh, yeah. If do a whole lot with it. And then uh, the last thing is, uh, more recently I'm working on, it's a universal controller remapper. And there's a whole lot of things that that can help with in speed running. I'm really excited to be able to get it out. And hopefully we'll see something by the end of the year with it. Cool. And people who want to try Mash Attack out can find you over in the casual room? That's right. Week? Later today I'll be in the casual room. I'll send out a tweet. And uh, yeah, a couple times throughout the week, if you're around, come around, try it, and we'll see how you do. Great. Well, thank you very much. The book, again, is Speedrun Science by Eric Kozel, also known as OmniGamer. It's available now on speedrunscience.com. And uh, until the end of this event, $10 from every purchase will be given to Doctors Without Borders. Also, you can get this book as one of the prizes in this marathon if you donate. So thank you very much for inter interviewing with me, Omni. My pleasure. And everyone, stay tuned. Up next, we've got a race of Crash Bandicoot 3. Thank you to Fiesel and thank you to OmniGamer for that awesome interview. I can't wait to try a mesh tech later. Ladies and gentlemen, during that segment, we have just reached $300,000. Give it up. Let's go. We are well on the way to $2 million and beyond. Let's go, guys. Thank you so much for donating. Thank you so much for watching. Now, coming up, ladies and gentlemen, is the Crash 3 Insane Trilogy 80% three-way race between Cameron Benjes, Murkaz, and Jay Hobbs. Let me break down what we got going on for you now. We have the Crash 300% world record holder. We have the Crash 300% second place holder. And we have the Crash 300% third place record holder. It is going to be a phenomenal time. And it is coming up shortly. Oh, we are super close to that future tense race. You only have until the end of this run. And seeing these guys are ridiculously fast, it's not going to take too long. So get those donations in for it. On that subject, large 201, since it's $10, says simply, let's see some future tents. Uh, $100 from the Doodle Abides says, the future of this Crash Bandicoot incentive is looking tense. Better do my part by donating toward it. Thank you. Endo Soma sends us $15, says, looking forward to another great Crash Bandicoot run. But I still have no idea what he says when he loses an Aku Aku mask. Keep up the good work, everyone, and please put this towards bringing everybody's favorite big boy, Donkey Kong, into the punch-out run. Thank you very much, Endo Soma. I want to take this time to throw a big shout out to one of our sponsors, The Yeti. GDQ's official shirt sponsor, providing tees and other merch for nearly eight years. They have donated over $100 million, okay, $1 million, to GDQ's partners' charities. I'm getting ahead of myself, I'm really sorry. Everybody visit T-H-E-Y-E-T-E-E.com to check out the GDQ collection. It's looking great this event, I gotta say. If you want to go over there, show them some love, get yourself a cool shirt, help out a good cause, that is a win-win-win. So much win. Since we are well on track to meeting the future tense race incentive, looking to the future, we have the Punch Out Arcade All Unique Fights Incentive. As is customary for arcade games, Punch Out Arcade keeps increasing in difficulty as you finish loops of the game. This difficulty increase stops at the 16th fight, but if met, Zeller 1 will smash through all 16 of these fights. You're going to be seeing some familiar faces in this Punch Out run, so that's a good thing to donate to immediately.
Drew T sends us $25, says, shout out to all the participants who dedicate so much time for such a great cause. You all rock. Also, a lot of love for that uh, blindfold incentive a little bit later on. Lance 220 sent us $20. Says lots of great runs so far, but here's to some fun challenges. Got to get that blindfold to punch out. Thank you. Big thank you to Gabby7 with a $25 donation. She says, so excited for the Crash Trilogy. Fifth year watching, love playing these games as a kid. Thank you, GDQ, for all that you do. Good luck to all the runners. $250 from 6 mil. They say, great job, everyone, at GDQ. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, Summer Games Done Quick is benefiting Doctors Without Borders, otherwise known as Missions Sans Frontières, is an international independent medical humanitarian organization that delivered emergency aid to people affected by armed conflict, epidemics, malnutrition, natural disasters, and exclusion from healthcare in over 17 countries in 2018. On any given day, thousands of individuals representing dozens of nationalities can be found providing assistance to people caught in crises around the world. They are doctors, nurses, logistics experts, administrators, epidemiologists, laboratory technicians, mental health professionals, and others who work together in accordance with MSS, MSF's guiding principles of humanitarian action and medical ethics. The organization received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1999. Good news while we're waiting to set up, the future tent incentive has been met. We're going to have a race after a race. Good job, everybody. Thank you so much. $15 with a message from Speed Self. They say, my, my first ever GDQ donation. I had to donate during the Crash Bandicoot run as it brings back so many great memories from my childhood. I really hope that we'll be able to see future tents get destroyed as well. You definitely will. Thank you for that donation. I'd like to take some time to talk about some of the prizes we have in store for you. The Crash and Spyro bundle by Activision is uh, super cute. It comes with CTR figures, a Crash themed coloring book, and a Spyro inflatable pool toy. It's a $15 donation. $5 donation, if you're not feeling so bold, gets you a, a very lovely Kirby charm. It's super cute. And uh, $20 will enter you into two fantastic punch out prints Little Mac and the Big Bald Bull and the knock you up punch on print, which is extremely beautiful. So be sure to get some uh, donations in for them. They're super great.
Yeah, the all unique run is definitely getting some love. Ikida sends his $20, says, hey all, been watching GDQs for about three years now and have loved every moment of it, so why not get as much out of it as we can? Put half of this to Future Tense Run and to the All Unique Run. Thank you so much. Another one of our awesome sponsors at GDQ is Fan Gamer. All profits from GDQ merchandise sales are donated to Doctors Without Borders. New official merchandise available from Deltarune, Dark Souls, Hollow Knight, Stardew Valley, Persona 5, and many more titles. Check them out over at fangamer.com slash GDQ. Professor Turtle sends us $20, says, Man, I do love Crash Trilogy. Got your stream up on the big screen at work? Everyone says hello. Well, hello to you, too. 